please share where you're based in the chat. we will get started with some housekeeping. In order to be more accessible, we have enabled closed captioning for this webinar. Look at the Zoom toolbar to turn on closed captioning in your view. You may need to click the three dots that say more to see the closed captioning option. Uh, please remain on mute throughout the webinar. Uh, during the Q&A, we will open up for people to ask questions and you may unmute at that time. For Q&A purposes, please feel free to share any questions in the chat as we go through the slides. Chapter staff, I, in essence me, <laughs> will make sure that questions that you put in the chat are shared with Dr. Kulata during the Q&A time. Okay, and any resources shared during the presentation will be sent via email to your, to, uh, with your post webinar materials along with the evaluation link. All okay. right, here's the disclosure statement. Dr. Kulata and all those in connection with the planning of this activity have no relevant financial relationships. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Paige Kulata. Dr. Kulata is a board certified child abuse pediatrician She's a native of New Orleans and completed medical school at LSU HSC in 2008. Dr. Kulata finished both her pediatric residency and child abuse pediatrics fellowship in Houston, Texas at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Upon completion of her fellowship, Dr. Kulata began working at the Audrey Hepburn Care Center with Children's Hospital of New Orleans. And now I will pass control over to Dr. Kulata. Okay, hi, I guess good afternoon, everyone. I am, um, looks like my slides are over and you can see everything. So this talk is on medical child abuse, how to pinpoint and look for medical child abuse in your practice. Um, <clears throat> this terminology has changed several times throughout the year. So I'm gonna go back through what it has been called and the names that it is sometimes still given to just bring some familiarity. So the term we use now is medical child abuse because the reasoning for that is that we want to, as pediatricians, identify that this is abuse for a child. This is something that's happening to a child. We don't, we're not psychologists or psychiatrists. We don't want to diagnose a parent, but this is something that is harming the child. And that's what we really want to focus on in our diagnosis and in our um, trying to get assistance for kids who are victims of this type of abuse. So previously it was also known as pediatric condition falsification. Munchausen syndrome by proxy, probably the most common that it's still called pretty frequently. Um, child abuse in the medical setting, caregiver fabricated illness in a child, and we feel that it's best understood as medical child abuse because we do want to point out that this is harming a child. So what does this mean and where does the terminology come from? So the background is that there was this um, person, Carl Friedrich Hieronymus, who the, or where these tales come from. He, there is the series, The Adventures of Baron von Munchausen that were adapted from 18th century bestsellers that were transcribed without permission by a British author who observed um, Carl Friedrich Hieronymus telling these tales of extravagance. And so they would swap army stories during the war with Turkey and Russia. And he used those stories in the tales that he wrote and um, Baron von Munchausen felt that his reputation was damaged because he was often called the king of lies. Uh, 
So the terminology was first coined by Richard, Richard Asher for Munchausen syndrome. And so that was in adults where he began talking about this syndrome. And then Sir Roy, Roy Meadow dubbed the terminology Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And the components of medical child abuse that we are talking about are first an illness that is stimulated or produced by a caregiver, somebody acting as the parent in the child. And how they do this is in various ways. So it can be exaggerated symptoms of something that's already occurring, actually just fabricating totally, faking symptoms or stimulating symptoms. So giving a child something, um, a medication, a substance that could be um, starting these symptoms so that they do actually look sick and inducing an illness in another person in some way. So the second thing is that the caregiver presents this child for medical evaluation, right? They're not just doing this at home and seeing what happens. They're bringing the child to doctors, to hospitals, usually persistently. And this presentation, this history that's fabricated is resulting in medical procedures, lab draws, imaging studies, um, surgeries, more invasive procedures that are happening. And then that perpetrator, the caregiver, denies knowledge that this is happening. They don't know why the child is ill. They're really trying to help. They often come off well to providers that they really want to do everything they can for their child. And then finally, these symptoms go away when the child is separated from that caregiver who's causing the symptoms. So the victims that we see are usually toddlers and infants. It really can happen at any age, but it's a little bit easier to identify in younger kids. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But with some series that have been done, typically what we see is that there is a delay in the onset of symptoms and when the child is actually diagnosed with medical child abuse. And that can be a pretty broad range. But the, the series that I'm referring to, there was typically a 15 to 22 month uh, period before the child was actually where there was a concern brought up for medical child abuse. So older children, it becomes more difficult because as children get older and are experiencing or are victims of this type of abuse, they can also adopt false symptoms in themselves and may go on to develop fictitious disorder or personality disorders in the future. And so as hard as these this type of abuse is for us to diagnose, for DCFS and law enforcement to get involved with, it becomes even more difficult as kids get older. And so what we'll hear a lot of times DCFS say in kids who are older, especially teenagers, but, but even like nine or 10 year olds, they might say, well, how do you know the child's not doing it? The mom says the child is the one saying she's sick. The child is the one telling the, the doctor what's going on with her. So it's really hard to differentiate where it's coming from. And their caretakers are usually mothers. That's what we think about. That's what we hear about most often. It can certainly be anyone. It can, we've had foster parents, we've had dads, we've had other caregivers, even babysitters. Um, typically those caregivers have some type of medical, medical background. Though I think this is getting a little bit more skewed because with our access to the internet and looking up disorders and having blogs and things, it, it really can be, anyone, because you can find a lot of medical information online. You can Google really quickly and see what kind of symptoms happen with certain disorders, what kind of testing should be done. But it is certainly a little bit easier to associate this with a provider, um, a caregiver having a medical background. And that can be as loose as um, a janitor in the hospital or someone who works in a medical clinic, and but maybe it's not directly associated with having a medical educational background, but um, something like that. So many of these caregivers don't have employment outside of the home. This child becomes their whole life. They really um, show that martyrdom for this child. And often they will have a medical, a mental illness or a suspected mental illness. So the patterns that we see are distortion, 
escalation of these symptoms and then the drawing in of attention, whether that be from medical providers and, and um, caregivers in the medical field, but also now with this increasing social media and online access, followers, donations, sharing, um, really some more secondary gain from that. And exposing these children to public viewing. So posting online, this is what's going on for my child. It's really terrible. The doctors don't know what to do with her. Um, drawing in that help from the public. And the providers are us, right? So as pediatricians, we're really put in a unique position because we have a very trusting relationship with the parents or the caregivers of the children that we're seeing. We trust in the history that they're giving us. And we that trust is often used, unfortunately, to the advantage of these caregivers who are abusing children in this way because we're not going to say, well, we haven't seen your child vomit, so let's wait and see if they vomit in front of me, or I haven't witnessed that seizure, so I don't really want to start anything right now. That That's not how our fields work. If a parent is giving us a history, generally, we take that history for what it is. They want to help their, their child. We want to help their child, and we move forward from there. Um, and I'll talk more about later, but our Met modern medicine is also designed that we have, especially in tertiary and quaternary care centers, we have are really siloed and subspecialized and sub subspecialized. There are many different types of providers out there where they are looking for rare conditions and are seeing true rare conditions and diseases. And so it's really in getting to be a setting where that is drawing caregivers like this into those types of fields. <laughs> and, and I talked about that unspoken medical contract of trust that we have with parents that we are seeing, with caregivers that we are seeing. So I'm going to get start with a case example, and we'll do a little bit of this now and follow up at the, at the end of the presentation. But this was a patient I had during my residency, actually. And it was, the child was a full-term baby. She was a product of IV, IVF, a very desired child of a single mom. She had initially had poor latch in the hospital and often had difficulty with feeding. So she was in the pediatrician's office a lot for weight checks. Her formula was changed. She had OT involved to help with that feeding. And despite all of these interventions, Mom still had a lot of concerns about feeding, and this goes on until she's about four months of age, and you can look at her growth chart here, and so you're looking at her growth chart. You see her growth chart looks pretty good, despite the history that we've been given so far, <clears throat> but what happens at five months old is she has a G-tube place because mom is continuing to report that she has poor feeding. And so with that G-tube, we continue to go down this path. She has poor tolerance of those G-tube feeds. She is vomiting persistently. So they convert the G-tube to a GJ tube. And then that GJ tube is often displaced. So her feeds are interrupted. She has to go back and forth to the hospital to get the GJ tube replaced. And because they have so much trouble with this, she gets TPN started and she has a central line. And so now she's got multiple points of access and she is um, hospitalized pretty frequently. She has lots of visits and you can see with the, I'll go back a few slides to the growth chart. It's pretty easy for us in you know, hindsight 2020. We're looking back at this case and like, well, that's a little bit confusing about why she would have a G2 place. Uh, but unfortunately, we do see this really frequently. It's it's much easier for me to go back and take all of her weights and put them on a growth chart and look at them than for someone to persistently be looking at these points when she's in the ER or at the doctor's office. But also, even um, I've had several cases where the pediatrician, maybe even a GI doctor is not really concerned about these feeding issues because the weight is okay. And parents have self-referred to surgeons and gotten a G2 place. So this can happen lots of different ways. I'll tell you that um, she was seeing GI and GI placed her G2 initially and was persistent in their involvement in the as the case progresses. So she starts to have more complications. She has many central line infections that are usually atypical bugs or combination of bacteria that are 
in these infections. She has repeated line places, placements and more infections, which prompts a question of, does she have an immune deficiency? Why is she getting all these weird infections? She becomes anemic. She has a DVT. And then she starts to get imbalances in her sodium which vary pretty widely during her um, admissions. And so around this time, she's about three years old. So she's had a long time in the medical system, in our medical system where I was working at the time. And so we have access to her records, to all of her records. And then she comes in with seizures. And so you can see the chart of her sodium that's at the bottom of this slide. And you can see how widely her sodium levels vary to scary levels. I don't think anybody would, any of us would want to see these levels of sodium in a child coming into the hospital or clinic or anywhere. Um, but really the last straw was with this wide variation and the frequent hospitalizations, she would have levels of sodium return to normal and within hours of going home would come back to the hospital with these high, high levels, finally, ultimately with this level that's almost up to 190. So once this is happening, despite some few concerns that have come up in the past, but ultimately at this point is when nephrology gets involved, lots of different services, the way that her sodium's correct, um, allow her physicians to know that this is not a situation that is possible. This is not really not making sense. It can't make sense with what is happening with her. And so that's when her physicians start to figure out that she's being given sodium through that access, through her G-tube to cause these wide variations in her sodium levels. And so we'll, like I said, we'll come back to this case, but the challenges of medical child abuse that we've talked about a little bit already are, it's confusing to talk to this caregiver. And that's the point of it, right? That they, they are trying to make us confused, trying to make us figure out what is going on. We, this is a complex child. We really can't understand it. We are looking for those zebras for those weird diagnoses and we just can't figure it out. We're, we're purposefully left lost in this communication. And so it, the other things that are difficult are this can happen in a child that has a genuine medical condition. So this child might really have an underlying syndrome. They might really have a diagnosed problem with some additional things that are not real. And so it becomes hard to differentiate what is real and what isn't. And then, of course, we have parents who are just truly high anxiety parents, have a sense of that vulnerable child syndrome. If you were at the NCE conference recently, Dr. Starling talked a lot about vulnerable child syndrome, and that is really a child who may have had some illness early on, maybe even a premature baby, where the parent is really worried. They just feel like their child is sicker or more likely to be sick than other children, but they're worried and they're worried about everything. They are not generally pushing for lots of different procedures. They often want to keep that baby close to them. They're not sending them off to do what you need to do, figure it out. They're really upset and really worried about all of these things and can often be reassured by a care a, a physician who has a good relationship with that parent. <clears throat> And then, of course, this information that we're being given by the caregiver is difficult to follow chronologically. It's difficult to corroborate. So the child may come into the hospital and they're acting fine. They're jumping around the room. The child never complains of pain, even though the mom still says they're in pain. We don't ever see them vomit. We don't ever see them have a seizure. It's not nothing's on the EEG. It, it's just we're not seeing that picture that the caregiver is giving at home. And it's just not typical of disorders that we are expecting. And so unfortunately, with training for many of us, we're trained to broaden our differential, to keep looking, to keep searching. If you, as pediatricians in particular, I think we are pretty humble usually that if we can't figure out what's going on with a child, it's not because it doesn't make sense. It's because we just don't know enough. So we need to find somebody who does know more and go to a different specialist and let's keep searching and let's keep looking. We're going to keep testing and trying to figure it out because we really want to help. But rather than just accepting that this doesn't make sense because it can't make sense because there is no phenomenon that would explain what's going on. <clears throat> 
And so <clears throat> this, um, the disorders that children with medical child abuse tend to get diagnosed with or their caregivers tend to latch onto are ones that are difficult to confirm or disprove. So maybe there isn't a test that will tell us for sure whether a child has a disorder or not. And so those are the ones that are really most latched onto by these caregivers. And many children who do have medical child abuse are often described as chronically ill, having special health care needs, and run, get into that picture of they get to the hospital and, oh, this is really a hard child. This child has so many things going on. You don't need to do what the mom says. She knows the child best. Really listen to her. Just do what she's asked. And we get on that train a little bit, but we, in most cases, we want to let that caregiver really take charge and advocate for their patient. But in these cases, it becomes very different. So caregivers in these cases are, um, to add to that difficulty, if this caregiver is confronted, many times they will remove the child from the practice, from the medical community, even from the hospital or even from the area and seek care elsewhere. And that's really, I think, scary for many providers that even if you are worried and you're considering, well, what do I do? But I don't want to isolate this child further. Maybe if I can keep an eye on things, then I can make it better or at least not make it worse if this, this child is taken away into a different medical community where they don't know what's going on with this child, right? Um, the other thing that we think about in these types of caregivers is that often, even though we, I think initially when getting into this field, my thought was, or what made sense to me, was if a parent knew that we were sort of onto them or we were thinking that this child didn't have anything, that they would back off, right? That they would try to let things lay low, maybe leave med the medical community, um, go elsewhere. But often what these parents do will make the child look more sick. So we're, the child becomes more at risk during that time period because they want to prove that something is actually happening. So I've had many children who are hospitalized where this um, process is kind of starting where people are worried, the parents have gotten a sense that people are worried, and then something happens to make them get sicker, get worse. And that is even with supervision in the ICU. And so it's really, really difficult. And we want to do the best job we can to make sure kids stay safe in this process. Um, and so the consequences of medical child abuse, are, of, course, of course, are needless procedures, lab work, imaging studies, surgeries, interventions that are not needed by this child and putting that child at risk for more harm. It can also result in ultimately a genuine medical condition. So a DVT, as mentioned in this, um, the patient that I talked about before as a result of some of these interventions. And of course, and finally, death even. So it may not be the intended consequence of the caregiver, but especially in younger children, there is a high risk of death when that caregiver is trying to induce symptoms or show that this child is sick. And then children may develop their own sense of invalidism or illness and not be able to attend school. They can't feel like they can't walk or um, do things in their future, develop mental health conditions of their own, including fictitious disorder. And I've mentioned social media a couple of times, but this really has come into play more. Now these slides are um, from year, a couple of years ago, but um, they are, we are seeing this more and more, especially in cases of medical child abuse. So you can see that these caregivers will reach out to the media for funding or just for that validation that look how well this mom is handling this, look how much she's doing for this child. And it's often not a an accurate representation of what's happening. So this is a child who I saw in the hospital who had come in for bleeding. Nobody had ever seen bleeding. And he was there briefly for monitoring and testing and lots of reassurance that I, there was nothing going on with him. And the mom writes that he's been fighting for his life every day. He has chronic leukemia, bone marrow failure, autoimmune neutropenia, and neonatal lupus. His immune system is not capable to withstand even the smallest virus or common cold. And he takes daily injections and she talks about donating bone marrow and none of that is none of that is accurate 
Um, this is a child who gets a make a wish trip to Disney. This is another um, event that was put on for the child I mentioned before. She says the doctors say they can't do anything for him. Again, he's well. Um, and so with, when I was in fellowship, when I was at Texas Children's, we got, it seemed like an, a lot of medical child abuse cases. And so it was an area of particular interest for me. It was something that I wanted to look further into and look at the cases that we had had in the last several years. And so some of the background of this, like I had mentioned, is that we really, um, medical child abuse is really set up to kind of increase in the way that our medical system is set up. Now, we are really have this special bond with parents and caregivers where we have that strong amount of trust. And we do have lots of resources and specializations where we can look and find and help with rare and atypical diagnoses. But that setup often puts us at risk for to be provider victims of medical child abuse. So what we were looking at, we're trying to identify patterns in these cases to see, is there any way that we can identify this sooner to prevent more interventions that are unnecessary? Is there anything we can do to identify this earlier? <clears throat> and so we have looked at cases that we had from 2006 to 2016. We had a 10 year period and those cases were categorized as MCA is medical child abuse indeterminate is it, there was no clear determination that we had made based on that and not medical child abuse is the final category and there were over 60 variables that we looked at in each of these extensive chart reviews to kind of get some points out of what what are going to be the differences between this population of medical child abuse and not medical child abuse and we were trying to figure out who gets this diagnosis of medical child abuse versus not and the criteria for that were also pretty stringent to say that this was a substantiated case. And what that meant was that we had a child who, where there was a consult to the child abuse team, the child protection team at the hospital. And those child abuse pediatricians felt that this was a case of medical child abuse. We would then go have a multidisciplinary team meeting with all of the subspecialists that were involved in the case. And that would also include pediatricians therapist, anybody that had touched this child, and have all of those providers also agree that they had no medical condition that explained what was going on with this child. And from there, we would have CPS involved to assist in that care, often separating the child to see if those sim um, symptoms got better. And we had to get that DCFS or CPS substantiation in order to call it. So many of these indeterminate cases that you'll see as I'm talking about, we felt that were probably medical child abuse in most of those cases, but we could not get DCFS on board to move forward with that. So it, it's that's some of the limitations with this, but that was our way of, of diagnosing and differentiating. So you can see we started with 157 patients where there were concern, 13 were excluded due to there being some misclassification or being outside of the time frame that we had looked for. And when we analyzed these patients, 58 had been diagnosed with medical child abuse, 58 were determined to not have medical child abuse, and 28 were indeterminate. So we had an, an equal population of medical child abuse and not medical child abuse when we looked at these. And these are some of the variables that we looked at. You could see in blue, we have things that happened to the patient. They got a psychostomy tube, a Vienna stimulator, whether they were involved in services, had an apnea monitor. The yellow and red are um, caregiver clarifications and um, also sibling information. Do we have a sibling that has a similar issue? Do we have um, a sibling who's also been the subject of a medical child abuse consult? And then um, more demographic information. When was their first medical intervention? How many states have they sought care in? How many hospitals have they been, have been involved in their care? Have they seen a sub-subspecialist like a mitochondrial specialist or a motility specialist? Um, length of hospitalization being over 30 days, number of hospitalizations, all those types of things. 
So if we're looking at the demographics of this information, what we had of these 144 children that were looked at were 46% were male. Um, the average age was, was five to six years old. And 40% of those were diagnosed with medical child abuse. 60% of them had more than 10 diagnoses that they carried. And so this is just showing that average age of consult five, and then the length of time within the medical system before anybody ever said, we need the child abuse doctors to be involved in this case, because we were worried what we got in the cases of medical child abuse were about 36 months. And so that is in line with the other two studies that we talked about being 15 to 22 months. Ours was higher. Um, <clears throat> and then the results, I've starred the ones that were significant for us. And the first is the number of diagnoses. There were 11 in the medical child abuse cases, over seven subspecialists involved, often kids that were referred to multiple providers within the same subspecialty. So meaning that they see a GI doctor and either get discharged or want to change GI doctors within that same group. And so they start seeing somebody else within that same group. Um, and then evaluated by a subspecialty within a subspecialty. So that's like a GI doctor who specializes in motility or a mitochondrial specialist or any subspecialty within an already subspecialized field. And these are some other points that we looked at, OTN, um, speech involvement, um, fevers, hospitalizations over 30 days. And then finally, um, caregiver and sibling cl um, classifications that we looked at that were um, specific for us were that caregiver with a chronic condition not medically confirmed. So that means a caregiver saying, I have lupus or I have chronic pain or something but they don't have anything to back it up. They can't give you medical records or produce the of truly having a disorder. Um, similarly with a sibling having a disorder that either can't be proved or that they can't show you is actually true with the medical documentation. And then finally, a caregiver that has a medical occupation was more um, likely to be true in a case of medical child abuse. And so one of the things that had come up initially were this, the thought that this would be more difficult in child who have com children who have complex care needs. So kids who are really do have sicknesses or who are in our complex care clinic, it was it going to be really more difficult to differentiate those patients from the patients with medical child abuse? And this is an article that speaks to that, but it also was also true for us is that when they're compared to one another, the um, this study looked at pediatric deaths in patients with complex care conditions, and their diagnoses did not align with those that we saw in children with medical child abuse. And so we discovered also in our patients that that was not really a confusing thing. We were able to differentiate those patients pretty easily. And so this slide, which you're looking at, is these are the subspecialists that we um, quantified being involved in these patients. And you'll see the stars again, these are significant findings of the blue line being medical child abuse and the pink line being patients who did not have medical child abuse. And it really stands out, I think the most for neurology and GI, and, and that's what we found. And um, it makes sense with those fields. So we talked about things that diagnoses that um, are latched onto that can't be Proved or disproved, right? So we're having these kids come in with diarrhea and vomiting and poor feeding without really needing to verify that before we move forward with interventions as we would in, in typical cases. Same thing with neurology, seizures that have been unwitnessed, movement disorders, things like that, but also cardiology, hemonc, urology, um, decreased urine output and uresis, um, persistent UTIs, um, chest pain, syncope, things like that, that are coming up for these providers. And so we had created this little graphic, and this is a typical toddler. So it's a, a healthy, normal child and kind of distorted her to show where the areas of most difficulty were, where these specialties were 
focused on with those cases of medical child abuse. And so you can see she gets a little bit distorted as her stomach and her head get bigger. And we point out just the different feels that are um, involved in these cases, but it really affects every aspect of, of pediatrics. <laughs> so this, um, these graphics just focus a little bit more on neurology and GI since they really do kind of strongly outline some of the other fields. And so when you look at the kids who have had neurology involvement, so that previous slide, what it was showing was 72% had involvement of a neurologist. And of those children with medical child abuse, 40% had movement disorders. Many were not attending school. Um, several had wheelchairs and even VNS stimulators. So some of the big ones, I mean, I think triggering for a lot of us is, is not attending school and um, moving on to GI patients. This was a 70% of GI involvement, um, a large portion with G tubes, central lines and seeing motility special. So, so this is just some of the things that, that stuck out to us. So what we found also that it's really difficult to identify there unfortunately are no list of things that I can tell you to look for in your practice that would let you know that this is a case of medical child abuse and we should act soon. Um, it's often really difficult in our communities to act quickly because we do have some limitations from DCFS and even from law enforcement to really help these children without pushing them away, right? Without losing them to a different geographic area or a different medical system or no medical system at all. Um, and so we have to try to figure out how to navigate that successfully in our communities to try to help kids and decrease medical interventions, but um, do that in a safe way for them. So some of the limitations for this were, I, I've already talked about, were that determination in our this was a diagnosis made by the child abuse doctors and group that I was with at the time. The documentation was also very difficult. So in any case of medical child abuse, we as child abuse pediatricians will go back and do a really thorough deep dive of all of the medical records. And sometimes that information is just not there. Many of those records did not have the occupation of the caregiver to compare that, or um, maybe we couldn't find all of the medical records and know all of the hospital system that that child was in. So, so there are definitely some limitations with that. Um, and so ultimately what we found are that there, these kids have more diagnoses, more subspecialists involved and sub subspecialists and subjective diagnoses that are not requiring confirmatory testing. And then siblings and parents with questionable medical diagnoses. And so I think you can kind of look at these and like, well, that's not super surprising, right? We expected that, um, but it is something important to think about. So in practice, the big things would be um, identifying those concerning factors in the presentation and feeling comfortable to look, especially if you are in a hospitalized setting and you can monitor these kids, is this really what is happening? Is what the caregiver is saying something that we can observe? Is the child really saying they are in pain or that these things are going on? Is it that every time you go into the room, mom says she, she's had diarrhea, she's been vomiting, but nobody has ever had to go in and clean it up. She's already finished cleaning it up and taking care of it before you have to go in. We're trying to collect and see if this child has had bleeding, but mom forgets to, to give it to you every single time. So I think, you know, having what we really stress many times is documentation and so that we can go back and understand what did the nurse observe when she was there? Was it just documented as one vomit or child refused to eat? Or did somebody actually see that happen? And what was the situation that was going on with that? And um, also getting some comfort in feeling that this isn't making sense and being confident enough to say that, I don't think we need to keep doing this. I don't think we need to keep doing blood work and keep doing imaging um, because it's not necessary. And also recognizing when that further evaluation is warranted or that specialist in your area is needed, but also being able to talk with them and to talk with all the providers that are available to understand what do we think is going on? Do we, are we all just 
looking and searching and moving forward or are we all having the same concern? And many times if we go back to providers that have been involved, they say, well, I was, I wasn't sure. It didn't make sense to me why this was happening, but we can't necessarily appreciate that in a note or if we haven't spoken to someone directly. And so is there a test to prove medical child abuse? Yes. Um, what test there is, is a therapeutic separation. And so you can look at this, um, this little pathway where the mom talks with the doctor and the mom and the doctor also both interact with the child. And so what we're doing in this process is taking out that caregiver essentially, which is hard. I think hard for everyone to stomach and look at this um, process, but this enables the doctor to really see, is this what's happening when that caregiver isn't interfering with that child? And so that was often what had been done in these cases. And um, I can tell you at the point that these cases got to a separation, they, the diagnosis had been made and was, was easily verified by this, um, by this process. And so there are many obstacles that come up when participating in this type of evaluation. And I think practitioners often feel distressed about these cases because you are first, or there's always the question of sharing details and sharing medical history and providing information even to other doctors, but also to caseworkers for DCFS and law enforcement. And of course, we know that as mandated reporters, if we're acting in the best interest of the child, if we are acting with the concern for the child's safety, then that is appropriate. And with medical child abuse in particular, often having a child abuse pediatrician involved, that involvement comes before um, or when we may not even go to the bedside and talk with the parent because as we mentioned, not alerting the parent, not alerting that caregiver and keeping the child safe from further harm or removal from that medical care often involves a child abuse pediatrician involvement without um, the parent knowing that at the time. So looking at medical records, reviewing everything, having multidisciplinary meetings, kind of getting a sense of what's going on with that case before we jump in and intervene, right? So that is going to be something that's important for the child's safety, but may feel different than a normal consult to another provider. <clears throat> so going back to our original case, in the months after this child was discharged, so she when this was identified, she there was a therapeutic separation that was done. She got well very quickly. She is in school. She's doing very well. She eats everything by mouth. She does not have any difficulty with eating anything by mouth. Her growth continues to be normal. She doesn't have any lines or tubes. And the sequelae that she had was a thrombus from her line and some scars and she is in therapy, but she went on to um, be adopted into a family where um, she has done very well. And initially that um, there was even some skepticism from them to be, maybe she really does. How could she not have a real thing going on? And they now understand that she is a very healthy child. And this is her actual growth chart. And so you can see while she's had some blips, they've been well within the range of normal and she continues on that path. And I got through when she was um, almost seven of following her. So the medical child abuse outcomes and why we're worried about this in addition to what the things we talked about is that the morbidity is 100%. The fatality rate is very high and is higher when the children are young, that infant period, and when the caregiver induces symptoms like suffocation or introducing material, the stakes are higher. They are become much more at risk. Um, and what can we do about it? So the biggest thing as a pediatrician that we can do, like any other diagnosis, is it has to be on the differential, right? It has to be, you have to think about it in order to ever identify it, even in kids that are chronically ill. But really, when you are concerned that things are not making sense, reaching out and getting the team together and talking about, are we doing too much here? Is this out of, is this a a procedure that I wanted to do as the provider or was I pushed to do this? Was it um, 
where is this coming from and and really understanding what we think is is best for that child um asking ourselves is are the history signs and symptoms credible are we seeing that can we verify that in any way or is the child receiving unnecessary things of course that's um the biggest question and who's instigating these evaluations and this treatment and so um i will say that in our community when i this case and many of these cases were when i was at texas children's and the process and response from cps were different than we've experienced here our cases of medical child abuse here are very very difficult because our reporting requirements are that we report to DCFS immediately, right? As soon as we have a concern, we should be reporting. So we don't really have that delay to let's really everybody talk and do your record review and we'll kind of get our act together before we get them involved. We really, we do need to let them know immediately. Um, and sometimes if they know immediately, they don't have the best understanding, right? So they might say, well, are you sure yet? And we're not going to do anything if you're not sure. And then the mom already knows that DCFS is involved. And so what kind of risk are we putting the patient at? So it's, it becomes really difficult. And I have, we've not successfully gotten a therapeutic separation done here. There have been other ways of monitoring and things that we have done. I think um, some of the most successful have been within those multidisciplinary meetings, really determining if we if we're all in agreement if we feel we can understand that this what this child's illness is and what it's not what things can we back off on can we agree to um, stop certain medications or try to start feeding by mouth and back off on interventions that are not necessary while also using dcfs to say we're trying to show you that these things are not necessary and if that caregiver refuses to allow us to take away some of these things that are not necessary, then that's when that would be DCFS's ability to intervene. And so them enabling us to monitor this child as we scale down some unnecessary things, or even ideally before that point, having them there to say, your doctor says the child is healthy and she doesn't need this. And we can't allow you to keep shopping around to find somebody who will do it. Um, so the explanation and really having a, um, a DCFS worker who has some understanding and is able to get involved is great, but the providers being understanding one another and being in agreement for that is also really hugely important because if I go to DCFS and say I'm worried about this child and I don't think they need any of these procedures, but they go to a different physician who says, well, she seems okay, but I really want to keep looking into if she has such and such. They're really not going to know what to do with that. If you doctors can't agree, how are we going to say anything? And so really evaluating and, and getting together and talking more and meeting more, I, I think would help with that. But being, um, having some of these things that I pointed out, hopefully being on your radar to identify maybe a little bit sooner, or at least have that concern brought up. But that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions um, <laughs> either now or if you think of anything later. Okay, at this time, you're welcome to unmute to share any questions or drop them in the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat so far, but okay. please feel free to unmute um, if you have a question. And like I said, I'm happy if you think of anything to discuss it at a later point, or um, if you send it to Julie and she gets it to me, I can um, I can address it then too. Dr. Kulata, could you tell us a little bit about the process of reporting to DCFS in case anyone has not gone through that process before? 
Sure. So with our reporting, we have an online, um, you can report online, or you can physically call the number. Usually what I don't have the website or number memorized, I usually Google it every time the Louisiana mandated reporting and the link will come up. Um, the, it, a lot of times I will report online. The form is pretty easy to fill out. That is the quickest way, but it's not the way if you think a child is in immediate danger, or immediate harm, it will prompt you to not fill out that online report and to make a phone call uh, to DCFS. But also if, if there is immediate danger, often that means a call to law enforcement too. Um, with the phone call reports, sometimes I find that easier just because I can explain myself a little better than I feel like I can type out what's going on and answer all the questions that are necessary, but that will also require a follow-up report. So whether that be an online report or a social worker sending DCFS that information. Um, so it's it's pretty easy. I mean, definitely the quickest way is the online report if you have a, um, a child that's not in immediate danger. And then Louisiana is a dual reporting state, which means that we have to make both reports to DCFS and to law enforcement. In some communities, you're able to just make the report to DCFS and everything's sort of covered that way. But for us, we have a little more work to do. And so the law enforcement report would go to where you think the, where you know the crime was committed. And that's the parish or jurisdiction that it would go to. And sometimes that takes a little bit of work to figure out. In um, Orleans, it's pretty easy, it goes to NOPD. But if you're in Jefferson Parish, for example, um, there's Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, there's Kenner Police Department, there's Gretna PD. So you will you may be bounced around um, to which particular jurisdiction that you would go to. And um, typically those reports you can make over the phone. Sometimes they will send somebody out to you, but they should accept those over the phone for the most part. <clears throat> okay, any other questions or follow-up? Feel free to, to go ahead and unmute if you have a question. Okay, I think I am going to keep us on with the, the follow-up um, slides that I have of housekeeping. Um, and feel free to email me any questions. I will drop my email in the chat right now. It is cme at laaap.org. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gulata. And thank you for everyone for being here. Uh, here's a few more details to wrap up. Make sure you take your evaluation. Um, it allows you to claim your credit and it also helps us to continue to improve. So even if you don't need credit for this activity, please go ahead and take the evaluation. It typically takes less than five minutes to complete. Um, and I will drop that link in the chat. Okay. And you can scan the QR code on this slide to get there as well. Our next pediatric gumbo webinar will be on November 9th with Dr. Maria Velez. She will be presenting hematological management of heavy menstrual bleeding for the pediatrician. Um, so here is our nice little graphic and I will drop the link to register for that one in the chat. Um, if you added the webinar series to your calendar, you should already have that link in your next calendar um, instance for the series. And on August 16th through 18th, we will be having our Senla Potpourri in Alexandria, Louisiana. Um, we invite all of you to join us. Um, registration is not open yet, but you can uh, go to our website to get signed up. Unfortunately, our website is down at the moment. So I will, when I send the updated information, I will also send the link to get signed up for emails. <laughs> 
And then finally, you can find more education from the Louisiana AAP on demand, including our recent webinars on RSV and prevention of stroke in children with sickle cell anemia on our YouTube channel, which is available at this QR code or the link below, and I will drop it in the chat. And that is it for today. So you will get about five minutes back um, and I will be sending the follow-up information probably by the end of the day on Monday to your email. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you all for coming today and thank you to get the, uh, Thank you again, Dr. Kulata, for speaking for us today. Thank you.